What's up, Pockheads? K Pock here. I'm going to give my review and thoughts on WWE Raw's 25th year anniversary. Now, if any of you know me personally or have heard me in the past mention, I'm a huge wrestling fan. Have been since I was, uh, you know, really old enough to toddle. I knew. A lot of wrestlers before I knew me knew my ABCs. Apparently, I still can't talk. But anyway, so last night was a well Monday night because this video probably won't be up in time. But anyway, um, the 25th anniversary of Raw is really something that was big in my mind because Raw first made its appearance when I was just three years old, going on four. So I was as much a part of it growing up as it was a part of me. So I grew up watching the likes of The Undertaker, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Owen Hart, uh, British Bulldog, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock. Uh, came in on the, like as far as memory goes, I came in on basically the uh, ending of Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, sort of era and into the new attitude era so i thought 2018 25th anniversary for the year that raw was created what better time to start my series idea of actually reviewing um the uh wwe stuff because you know that's something i wanted to do for a while and give my theories thoughts and opinions on things this one thing i've noticed is i'm pretty good about um predicting storylines or even offering storylines and i open uh the comments and everything to agree with me disagree give me your thoughts and opinions and ideas and whatnot as well so let's jump in here so the opening segment we hear good old jr and jim ross it was so good to hear them again uh their voice is the their voices are the voices i hear even now when it comes to uh the intro you know sorry i've got both dogs in here you'll have to excuse any kind of sounds but the whole opening uh Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monday Night Raw. I'm Jim Ross alongside Jerry the King Lawler. And, you know, it was I had goosebumps just hearing them. But let's get to the meat of it. Shane and Stephanie came out to the ring to introduce uh, their father, whose idea it was to start Raw and bring wrestling up to what we know it is today. So... Last night, you know, I've got something here as a reference sheet, but I'm going to pretty much paraphrase on my own here. Last night, we hear them introduce Vincent Mann, the Reina goes crazy, okay? And the one thing different that I noticed this time around is when Vince's uh, music hit, instead of the crowd booing over the music and stuff to where you can't hear it they began to sing along with it which is something that i can honestly say i've never heard done before until last night so that was really good and vincent man he stepped out onto the ramp and took it in a minute all right you could see you know you could see he was proud of his accomplishment then as he started walking down the ring, you get the Mr. McMahon strut, you know, you know the strut where he's just swinging his arms and going down the ring at like the big boss that he was in the attitude era, the big tyrant he was. So just seeing that instead of a normal walk to the ring, I knew something was up. So, you know, in the ring, you know, they... The crowd started saying, thank you, Vince, thank you, Vince, thank you, Vince, which was something that not a lot of, not, that is not really heard because he has perfected his heel persona so much. So again, he 
took it in for just a moment. And, you know, to make a long intro short, he gave his thanks to the crowd and wished them a uh, pleasant evening and to have a good time. And Steph and Shane, thinking this is so much uh, bigger than just a little appearance, decide to try to present McMahon with a complimentary or commemorative, I'm sorry, commemorative plaque. To this, Vince McMahon just kind of snarled and he started the whole Mr. McMahon heel sort of thing, bad mouthing about the idea that the GoFundMe was used to make a plaque. And he commented that a plaque was something that was in the teeth of all the people there. And that the only person he had to thank for everything that went on was himself. Cue the asshole chant. They said it, asshole, asshole, you know, that chant. That's what we know. That's how Vince McMahon was in the Attitude Era. He had perfected that heel persona so much but it also showed how quickly Vince can make his fans the people that he brought into wrestling he can control them first they were chanting and giving him adoration and just with a few words he's so good at being either good or bad that just in like Literally like four minutes, he had the whole arena hating him. So, he gets ready to try to leave it there. He keeps bad-mouthing and trash-talking and stuff. And what do we hear? The glass shatter. Anybody who hears the glass shatter knows who's coming. Stone Cold Steve Austin makes his way to the ring with his signature BMF walk. And if you guys don't know what BMF stands for... I'm not going to repeat it, but you can go back on the WWE Network or some of the past uh, uh, videos and documentaries where Stone Cold explains what BMF stands for. I'm pretty sure if you're a wrestling fan like me, you know what it stands for. Alright, so he's in the ring. He salutes the crowd by going to all four corners like he always did. And you know what his salute is. You know, I'm not going to you know repeat that so then we get a stare down he's looking dead at vince and vince is like okay i I see the look in your eyes but i i'm much older i can't take a stunner basically but shane mcmahon he's in his prime go for it so uh it was funny because that's exactly what old stone cold did he stunned shane mcmahon and then turned to look straight at vince again vince didn't get off easy you know, he was out here trash talking WWE Universe, and the WWE Universe is what made Vince as big as he is. So, Austin don't take too kindly to that, but it's okay. So, Vince decides to start using bribery. In his hand, he pulls out two Miller Lite cans, and it's like, you know, for old time's sake. So, after a few toasts and stuff, and a few hugs where they seemingly you know are bearing the hatchet so to speak on everything you get the whole dta feeling because you see austin's poised and ready and bam stunner to the boss second stunner to shane mcmahon when he gets up austin salutes and leaves my rating for that segment is pure platinum Because that is exactly what the Attitude Era was mostly known for as far as rivalries go. So, I loved every part of that. There's not a thing in the world I would change about that. That's why I gave it a platinum rating on that one. The execution, the brilliance behind it, and the fact that you get to see Mr. McMahon in character along with everybody else. And still... Fans loved it. They eat it up. I would expect nothing less of Austin and Vince McMahon in the same ring. Nothing less. Moving on. Give me just a second to scan down here see what was next. Next was the eight-woman tag team match 
featuring Asuka, Bailey, Mickey James, and Sasha Banks versus Sonya Deville, Mandy Rose, Alicia Fox, and Nia Jax. So, we have eight of the many promising divas now in the women's division geared up for a match. All right, so the match was okay at best. All right. And I understand uh, WWE had a lot to work in to three hours with all this. So, that being said, their match I felt was a bit short, but it was well done. Especially this part that I want to talk about. As Asuka, Bailey, Mickey, and Sasha are celebrating their victory in the ring. Mickey James is up on the top rope. Asuka wastes no time. Dumps Mickey James. Well, Sasha Banks and Bailey are surprised. They're like, what in the heck are you doing? And Bailey was the first to try to confront, and Asuka attacked, threw Bailey over the top rope. So that left Sasha and um, Asuka. And Sasha uh, was thrown out as well, leaving Asuka the only standing woman in the ring. And it basically reflects two things. One is what she's been saying so far is true. Nobody is ready for Asuka. That's what she says and claims. And honestly, I'm starting to believe it. And number two, and this is the message she wanted to get across to her teammates. We may have been partners on this night, but come Sunday, the first ever Women's Royal Rumble, there are no partnerships. There is no friends. This is for a spot in history. This is for a spot at WrestleMania. So wake up because I want you to bring your best is what she's saying because I'm going to bring my best. That being said, I give that whole segment a gold rating because of the effectiveness of how it was done. Um, my thoughts and predictions as far as the Women's Royal Rumble goes, it's going to come down to these four at the very last. It's going to be Nia Jax, Asuka, Bailey, and Sasha. And there's two different storylines they can go with on this one. The first one, real simple, Nia Jax just overpowers them and wins. This is also the most predictable as well. She goes on to WrestleMania to face the women's champion, whoever that may be. And I want to say it's going to be Alexa. Because of the fact that Alexa has held on to it for so long. And um, unless they do some major changes because of injury uh, scheduling uh, the WWE has a habit of whoever's champion between Royal Rumble and um, uh, WrestleMania is going to keep that title until WrestleMania where it could change hands. Now, I could be wrong on that. I have, I have seen titles change hands before Mania, depending on what the storyline is going to be, but... My point is, if Nia wins, that's going to set up Nia versus Alexa Bliss for the Raw Women's title. Here you have the two besties, two best friends, and they get to go against each other. Well, same can be said for this next scenario. Uh, if Asuka, Bailey, and Sasha do form a temporary alliance to get Nia out. All right, that's going to leave Asuka, the hot upcoming woman wrestler, going against two, or going against somebody who's established in Sasha Banks and somebody who's just been in obscurity, kind of in limbo with Bailey. My next one is we see... Um, a temporary alliance, uh, an alliance between Sasha Banks and Bailey to get Asuka out. And I see this scenario being better as Sasha is celebrating 
the fact that they eliminated Asuka, that she's no longer the biggest threat, Bailey comes up from behind and dumps Sasha out before they even have any kind of fighting going on, thus sparking a heel turn for Bailey and giving her a new sort of, I guess, go to uh, mm, a new relevance, if you will, in the women's division. And we will, and if they do this route, they need to show that vicious side that Bailey showed at no mercy against Alexa Bliss with the uh, Singapore Canes and stuff. So there's two really good scenarios there that could potentially happen. All right, so that is as far as I want to go with the women. The next is a backstage segment with Kurt Angle bringing in a lot of managers and general managers and stuff as well. Now this was just... Oh, I forgot to give my rating for uh, the previous thing. Eight-woman tag and everything. Wait, I think I did. I think I gave it a gold rating. Anyway, this next segment um, with Kurt Angle and all the managers was great. All right, I'm not going to go into details on that because it was such a small angle. We saw the boogeyman, and it was really, really cool. You know, so that was just absolute cool and it was a uh, comedy at its best it's what Kurt Angle was known for and made a career of just goofiness and stuff like that and just seeing the managers there was fantastic the only thing that could have made it better was if Paul Bearer was there instead of the boogeyman so rest in peace Paul you've got a lot of respect from me so I give that segment a gold because it's just it was just too comedic and too well done, you know, for me to give it less than that. Now the next in that sequence was the Undertaker returns, but I don't want to talk about that right now. That's going to be my closing statements because I got a lot to uh, discuss with that one. So the next thing we see is. Back at the Barclays Center, the APA, Heath Slater, and Rhino are backstage playing poker and things like that. So I'm going to break down and put all the segments you see of them into one complete rating here. It was very well done. Very APA-ish and seeing a lot of people come in, including the Million Dollar Man. And uh, we saw Jeff Hardy in there, actually, and it's good to see him doing better after his surgery i was glad to see him there in the end uh he uh he slater gets caught cheating and apollo cruz and uh titus o'neill took very big exception to this and they were just about ready to fight and apa apa mind you who thrived on fights beer and money at that time when they were big yeah spirit i see you they said hey 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 this poker game is civil if you want to fight go out to the ring and that's exactly what they did all right um and in that we saw heath slater and rhino uh lose to titus o'neill and apollo cruz now let me address Heath Slater here. If there's any new talent that is going to have the last laugh when all is said and done, why did you, puppy? It's going to be him because let's look at what he has done as far as the um, legends go. This is really interesting. This is very important. Keep in mind that he has uh, stepped in the ring with Sid Vicious. He stepped in the ring with Vader, Doink the Clown. He has stepped into the ring with Lita. All right, all four of them, yes, they, well, Doink didn't beat Heath, but the others did beat Heath, and it was kind of a running gag that, yes, he would be the fall guy for the Legends stuff coming in. But when it's all said and done, how many other superstars today can say they stepped into the ring with them? Not many. 
And Heath Slater can also say he has stepped in the ring with the likes of The Undertaker and Kane when he was part of the whole Nexus thing. So, at the end of the day, he has stepped into the ring with more legends than Roman Reigns has. So, food for thought there. I give the whole APA Heath Slater Rhino segment and the the manager and the legends and superstars involved in that little segment a gold because it was just too good uh, to uh, say no to. And the Dudleys coming out was just the icing on the cake and attacking Slater, putting him through the table, hitting him with the was up. That was just the icing on the cake for that. The parade of general managers was a nice touch. Um, Daniel Bryan and everything. It was awesome to see those general managers come out. They have helped uh, pave the way for other managers. It's really a shame they didn't get any more time than what they did. And the, uh, the announcers really didn't talk much about them. So I give that a silver. I mean, it was great to see them, but it was uh, it was kind of, in my mind, a waste of a spot for something bigger. Like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, another match. All right. Next is The Miz versus Roman Reigns for the Intercontinental title. I, for one, am glad to see the Intercontinental title getting much better... Um, recognition now as the workhorse's title and its prestige is brought back up we do have the Miz love him or hate him to thank for this okay so this match kicked into high gear right at the beginning and it's honestly to me the best match of the night so I'm not going to go into details as much as I would because I'm already going on like 23 minutes and there's a lot more that I want to talk about, but in short, Miz re, uh, regained his title, and this frees up Roman Reigns to possibly be a winner for the Royal Rumble. So, my thoughts on the Miz getting the title back, it's mixed. Okay, on one hand, I can see why they did it, alright, because he, like him or hate him, is one of the most must-see superstars right now. Okay, and Roman Reigns needs to be higher because they're pushing him to be higher than Intercontinental and Mid-Carter. But the fact is, the Intercontinental title is the workhorse's title now. It's literally the title you work for. It's the title that WWE says, okay, we're going to give you this title as a trial run before we try to make you the face of the company. Let's see how you do. With this title, let's see how the fans react to you. This is your chance to prove to us that you can be WWE Championship material. The match, and so far the story, I give a gold. Okay, because um, there's just so much that can actually go on to this. So, on to the next segment. We have the Peep Show with Christian. It was so good to see that, and uh, it was a shame that Edge couldn't make it due to uh, conflict in schedules with him filming overseas in Ireland, but it's okay. So he brought out Seth Rollins and Jason Jordan, and, you know, Seth started talking, being respectful, and then Jordan butted in, and, you know, he is playing the whole privileged uh, superstar role very, very nice. He's really getting the fans to uh, really pack on heat for him, and I think that's a good move because um, there is a lot that goes into the that's There's a lot to be said about favoritism going on. That's a big word that they're using right now. So, you know, nobody in that... Uh, in that crowd has any kind of love for Jason Jordan right now. And, you know, that that's a good thing because what makes a good heel is the fact that you can get under the crowd's skin so easy. So the bar came out and interrupted, 
and the quote, it is not your dad who sucks, you suck, and everybody started chanting, you suck. Jason did exactly what I thought he was going to do, attacked, and, you know, Seth Rollins, he did back him up, but almost begrudgingly, and what happened next, you know, Cesaro, uh, Sheamus was out in on the floor, leaving Cesaro wrapped up by Jason. Rollins came off the top rope to hit a flying elbow, but Cesaro... He ducked out of the way, and he hit Jordan. That sets up a really good crack in the foundation of these two to um, build an interesting story and make uh, Jason Jordan that much bigger of a heel right now. So that whole thing was pretty well done. Uh, the fact is that... The fact is, there though, that they're pushing Jason Jordan way too fast, in my opinion. So I'm going to have to give that a silver because there's so much more they could have done in a better time frame. Backstage interview, we have Alexa Bliss, you know, getting uh, getting interviewed and asked if she would be champ at Mania. We see Charlotte Flair come in. And she paraphrased her own father by saying, to be the woman, you got to beat the woman. And she was like, if you don't believe me, just ask the man himself. Ric Flair showed up, put over Charlotte in a good way, and just they both did a father-daughter woo that uh, kind of sort of blew the mic, honestly. So that was an interesting little segment. I'm going to give it a bronze because, uh, honestly, I don't see how Charlotte tied in to the whole storyline with Bliss right now because she's wrapped up with Asuka and uh, Charlotte is over there on SmackDown. Yes, she is champion on SmackDown and I guess in a way it works, but that's one of those things where it would have been much better for um, Alexa to pack on some more heat before the Rumble. So let's go back to the Manhattan Center where we see Bray Wyatt and Woken Matt Hardy in a match. Alright, so short, sweet to the point. This one disappointed me. Alright, I did not want to see this match right now. Because the build up, it, they're still building it. They really are still building this, and it would have been much better suited as maybe a another promo. Okay, and the match very much lacked a really good. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? A really good flow, if you will. It lacked that. So, um, I'm going to get a bronze, and that's being really nice about it. And I'm not trying to be very critic, uh, criticizing or critic or whatever. I'm just giving my thoughts and opinions on things. Now, what I see happening. And there's two ways that they can do this. One, they can start building up factions again. All right, and in, and in doing that, they could actually have Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy have this bizarre sort of connection centered around Sister Abigail and whoever Matt Hardy's, um, I guess, higher superior is in his mind. And they can either battle or they can combine. Now hear me out on this one. Matt Hardy has a cult leader persona right now. Bray Wyatt has been a cult leader persona since the day he came in as Bray Wyatt. You have the Bludgeon Brothers on SmackDown. They are making a huge impact right now. Harper and Rowan are hotter now than they have ever been. So, what if they come back under Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy's tutelage, both of them, and are led? Well, right there is a very good start to a major faction. A very powerful, very scary thought. Add in Jeff Hardy when he returns as Brother Nero Hardy. And you have a major 
a major, major faction that's full of star power, full of cult following, just bringing in a whole new darkness to the new era. So that right there is five people. And there needs to be one more person in that cult. And it, shockingly, I'm shocked to hear myself say this. It doesn't need to be Sister Abigail. Sister Abigail can be an alter ego of Bray Wyatt. Instead, bring in Bo Dallas. We've been seeing uh, a darker side of Bo Dallas, a hint of a dark side from time to time. I'm just going to leave it there. So, we have them either can merge and go against a faction like the Bullet Club and the Shield and stuff, or they can just battle. Either way, both are going to be really interesting to see. So, I give the idea that WWE is going with right now a silver, but the execution that they did last night at the Manhattan Center is bronze, and that's being nice about it. Alright, we the next part is the Barclays Center, and this was in very, very good taste for WWE. They brought out a lot of the female superstars that have been uh, very uh, pivotal in the growth of Raw and paving the way for the women superstars we see now. All right, all they all that they did is they recognized them, brought them out on stage, where they just basically waved hello and left. Honestly, that's okay in my eyes, because you know you had uh, Maurice and Maria, both are up there and they're both expecting, and I'm sure Trish was there and needed to get back home to her new little one you know so it was okay that they did that i give the silver because it was a very good um a very good send off for them the only reason i didn't give it a gold is that they didn't mention china and lita wasn't there um and those are two ladies who were very very pivotal as well because if not for Lita, the main event for Raw, the first ever women's main event for Raw between Trish Stratus and Lita would have never happened. All right, we would not have known that match. So uh, for WWE to leave out, uh, Lita was bad. And China, she was the first woman to really come in and be a powerhouse and go up against men as well. So... Uh, to leave out those two ladies was very, uh, I'm not going to say disrespectful or anything, but, and I'm not going to say it was in bad taste. It was just, uh, inconvenience, I guess, or bad thinking on WWE's part. Now, China, rest her soul, she wouldn't have been able to make it there, but they could have at least mentioned her. And they did later. And I'll get to that when that time comes backstage. Now, we see Elias walking with himself, and he rounded a corner, and guess who was there? Chris Jericho, with his New Japan t-shirt. Y2J chance uh, broke out. He commented about Elias and said he uh, he wrote a guitar. Uh, he wrote a song and asked to use Elias' guitar. Elias said no. He's like, it's all right. I brought my own. He strummed a couple of chords purposely out of tune, might I add. Started calling uh, Elias stupid idiot and saying that Elias just made the list along with his stupid scars. I give that a silver. It's It was cool to see that. And it it's good that uh, WWE is forming an alliance, so to speak, with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Because that can bring in so much more star power. So Walk with Elias comes to the ring. He starts... Uh, <clears throat> start singing and things like that and trash talking you know doing his whole thing and uh you know cena comes out ruined everything and challenged elias to do something about it and elias basically looks at him looks around says that's not how it works 
He doesn't take orders from him or Brooklyn scumbags, in his word. Then he tried to jump Cena, who was ready for him, hit him with a five-knuckle shuffle, uh, got out of the AA with a uh, low blow, a la China style, my I add, where it just, she hits and it lingers for a few minutes, or a few seconds, rather. Then he nailed Cena with a guitar shot to the back that I haven't seen since Jeff Jarrett swung his guitar. So, John Cena is laying on the mat. That's a good way to put over a new rising talent and heel is, you know, for John Cena to take the blow like that. Now, I'll be the first to admit, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. I'm not a Cena fan. Never have been. But, he did good. Uh, Last night, I'm going to give it a generous silver. Because it sets up a good rivalry between those two. On to, uh, like I said, I've already mentioned the tag team match with Worldwide and Heath Slater and Rhino. Uh, nobody won, you know, Dudley's and everything. We hit backstage. We see AJ Styles, and he's about to be interviewed by the lady there. And he's like, um, I actually have somebody lined up to conduct this interview with me. And he introduced Mean Gene Oakland. And this was a shock to me because I didn't expect Gino to be there. It was great to see him. And he's actually in good health considering his age. I was glad to see it. And Styles did a quick Hogan impersonation and it was horrible. Sorry, AJ, but it was horrible. So, with that being um, said, he talks about Kevin and Sammy and. Uh, you know, about how he's going to retain his title and stuff like that. I I would give it a silver if they brought, if Mean Gene actually was able to say something and stuff, but he wasn't. You know, it was just AJ talking and uh, Gene was beside him. So I give it a high bronze. So now... There are two or three segments left. And there's two really big ones that I'm going to talk extensively about. And that is both The Undertaker and DX. I'll get to that here in a minute. Let's go to the closing segment real fast. Brock Lesnar, Kane, and um, Strowman. Superstars flooded the ring to keep Braun from getting to Kane, but... You know, it it didn't work. You know, they were in each other's faces, and they were ready to attack, but, you know, they kind of backed off. And then out came Paul Heyman, introduced Brock. Brock ran to the ring, and basically all hell broke loose. Lesnar was put through a table, and that was the end of that. There could have been a lot more done with that, okay? Now, I understand the chaos and stuff is good because that's what Raw was all about. I give it a bronze because it could have been so much better. There could have been words between all of them and just building the story more. Now, on to the two biggest ones, in my opinion. First, let me talk about the DX reunion. Out came Triple H, Shawn Michaels, to the song we all know and love, Break It Down, DX. They throw out glow sticks, and in typical DX fashion, Sean tried to talk about some of his favorite moments in DX, and Triple H was like, hey, we, we can't talk about that one. So he tried another one, can't talk about that one. And Sean made a uh, plug, or he was like, you know, I, th- I find it funny that it's that I used to be the leader of DX, but now you're the leader of everything, and I can't do nothing. So that was just typical Shawn Michaels hilarity, you know, so, and, uh, but he did plug the WWE Network, which you can get for $9.99, there's your plug WWE, you're welcome, from K-Pop Studios, so, Triple H then started talking about how DX was at the forefront of everything, and he was right, they were, when they first came in, it was 
Shawn Michaels, Triple H, China, and Rick Rude, and he mentioned China. Now that went a long way for me to hear Triple H say China and mention her leads me to believe that he's let go of their bitterness. Now I don't know if it was her passing or if he had let go of it a long time ago and just couldn't say anything because of everything that China had done past her WWE career. But the fact that he was willing to say her name and mention her, whereas used to they didn't, was a big plus in my book. And he said, you know, for 25 years, we've been at the forefront, and we're going to be at the forefront for 25 more years. Cue the next part. He says, we didn't come alone. You hear the New Age Outlaws themes come on. Their typical entrance, and then they introduced X-Pac. And then... It was really good to me to see X-Pac come out and then to hear the crowd chant his name when uh, he was a uh, part of the very first Raw, because he was. He, as the one two, three kid, faced Razor Ramon in the very first uh, Raw. So that was, I think it was the very first Raw. Anyway, it was on a Raw. I, th- I want to say it's the very first one. And he was dubbed the one, two, three kid. And when I heard the ch- the crowd chanting, one, two, three, one, two, three, it took me back because I was like, oh my God, they actually do remember him as something besides Xbox. So that was a good thing. He introduced his um, fellow Click member, NWO uh, friend, Scott Hall, a.k.a. Razor Ramon, to come out to the ring. So Scott Hall made his way to the ring. And did a trademark. Hey, yo, you know you can't have a party without the bad guy. Enough said. It was it was gold to see not only the DX, but most of the click there. And I was a little bit upset last night that uh, Kevin Nash wasn't there. But I read this morning why he wasn't. He had just gotten out from a full knee replacement surgery. And he couldn't be there for that. So um, I can I can forgive that. So now, they're all in the ring. And what do we hear? We hear Gallows and Anderson music. Or was it Finn's? Either way, Finn Balor came out with uh, Gallows and Anderson. They came to the ring, big smile on their faces. Triple H and Shawn Michaels are at the forefront of DX. And instead of Triple H and Shawn Michaels having a little mock insult or a... uh, little quip about them they did something I didn't expect this for those of you who don't know that is the wolf pack click to sweet sign and the Balor Club has been saying too sweet lately and throwing this up as well so I knew something was about to happen I did not expect Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and DX to pass the faction torch, so to speak, to them last night. And that was real, really, really pleasant to see that. And then after the match with, um, who is it, uh, The Revival, you know, Anderson and Gallows, they won against the The Revival. And they didn't really like that too much. So, um, one of them decided to attack, and he got pretty much all finishers performed on him from DX, Click, and the Balor Club. Um, the only one who didn't hit their finisher, and I was a little bit disappointed, was Razor Ramon. I expected to see uh, Razor's Edge, and... The whole segment was just too sweet, and if you're not down with that, I've got two words for you. I give that a platinum. That whole segment was a platinum because it featured superstars of the past, superstars of the future, passing of the faction torch from DX to a new uprising and what I will feel be a very dominant and legendary team in the Bullet Club, with uh, or Balor Club, whatever you want to call it. 
it's the same thing. Ballard Club, you know, they're going to go somewhere. Fans knew about the Ballard Club, and the fact that Triple H was willing to recognize them and bring them over says a lot about his character now as opposed to the Triple H that we first knew. Now the big one. The Undertaker. Since WrestleMania of last year, we have all been wondering, is The Undertaker retired? Yes or no? And I'm actually going to pull up something that will help me on this one because I go into a lot of detail on this one. Um, it's no mystery that The Undertaker has always been my favorite superstar. All right, hands down, always been my favorite. I've got an action figure up there. I've got a couple more action figures of him. I'm wearing an Undertaker shirt for crying out loud. Matter of fact, the same one I wore last night. It's clean. It got washed today. So, he comes out to address all these um, talks of retirement and stuff, all the rumors and stuff. And I want to pull up what he says word for word. And I want to break it down for you guys on everything that he said and what it means. Because I've followed The Undertaker since I was just knee high to a squirrel. And if anybody knows how to make riddles out of his own promo, it is The Undertaker. So, we all remember WrestleMania where he... Dropped his hat, gloves, and cloak in the middle of the ring. And more on that in a little bit. So, I'm going to break down everything that The Undertaker said in his promo. Um, we all know that the streak was, in fact, ended by Brock Lesnar. His second loss came from uh, Roman Reigns and Roman received a lot of flack for that like really fans let him have it just balls to the wall have it for almost a year he's just now getting back into their good graces so I'm trying to find what he what the undertaker himself said word for word and it's actually very hard i had it earlier on the phone and i just can't find it now um it may be there still give me just a minute all right i have somewhat found it now so here i'm going to break down what he's saying the carnage began on this sacred ground of evil 25 years ago. For 25 years, I have been digging holes, and any person who dares step foot into the dark side has been buried. What that means is, as part of WWE's first Raw segment, he was there. And most everybody who have went up against him has fallen, for the most part if not in their first match with him at some point. For 25 years, I've taken legends and ripped them off their pedestals and thrown them into cold, dark earth. He has faced many legends, such as Hulk Hogan, The Ultimate Warrior, Jake Roberts, Coco Beware, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, Mick Foley. He has faced all of them, and he has beaten them at some point. Stone Cold answered to the Reaper. Mick Foley answered to Reaper. Kane, my own flesh and blood, had to answer to the Reaper. They all tried. They all failed. They all tried to end his career and failed. And now on this sacred ground, I declare for all those who have fallen, it's truly time for you to rest in peace. That sentence right there is what has people baffled. Okay. Now... The way I see that, he didn't deliver the, you will rest in peace, like normal. When he said that, I declare for all those who have fallen, all his former opponents and stuff, it is truly 
time. As in, now is the time that you can finally rest. Because, you know, he is done claiming souls. And that's what I think it is. I think the Undertaker, in his way, his own way, was declaring his retirement. And I have some uh, thoughts and theories, or thoughts and evidence to sort of back up my theory on this. First thing, he came out, yes, he looks like he's been in great shape, he was moving around better, but when I looked at him, I didn't see the whole ripped muscle undertaker. Like, if you look at him, I'm going to pull this over here, where we're recording and stuff. If you look at the Undertaker right here, you can see that he's nowhere near as big. And I hear what you're saying out there. But he's old. You know, he's going to lose muscle mass. Yes, this is true. But this is more like he's just trying to stay in shape for his own health, not trying to amp up for a match. And look really close at his hands right here. There are no gloves. Okay? You, I hear you out there asking, why is that important? It's important because any time The Undertaker has come out, except for last night, for the most part, he has always had gloves on. That was his uh, way of protecting what he called his soup bones, was his gloves. They're bare hands right here, and that's just basically athletic tape to complete the uh, the gothic look there is no gloves there and if he's gearing up for a fight he's going to have his gloves on so we all remember this scene right here and we all remember watching him walk out now one thing I want to bring up is if you go back and you watch where the undertaker takes off his hat you look into his eyes he's got the realization and he's got the uh, watery look like he's holding back his own tears and when he takes off his hat you see him inhale and breathe kind of like this <sighs> like it's all over you know he knows it's over he doesn't have to carry the weight of WWE on his shoulders anymore and then the biggest thing, the biggest indicator to me that he was done was at WrestleMania last year. The Undertaker has always prided himself on um, never breaking character. There has been superstars that go to the back that have said and gone on record and said they would hold you know competitions to see who could make The Undertaker break character. And the only one who ever came close to making The Undertaker break character was Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold said that he was talking and joking and stuff. And uh, The Undertaker, in, during their match, this was all during the match, The Undertaker began to crack a smile and he had to flip his hair down to hide it. So The Undertaker takes his character very seriously. And... uh what we see as he's exiting the ring at WrestleMania is he goes to the fans, all right, to the people who are at ringside. Now, the only time I've ever seen The Undertaker do this was in his American Badass years. As the Phenom, as the Dead Man, he never did that on camera. It's stuff because it would, it would make him appear human. And that night, he went... And he hugged a lady in the, in the uh, crowd. Well, that lady, as many people know, is Michelle McCool. And you can see the Undertaker mouth the words, I love you. Now, he would not have done this on uh, television and in front of people if he was trying to maintain his character. So, do I believe the Undertaker is done? Yes, I do. 
However, this is all theory and speculation from me. I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, I'm glad I'm wrong. But I don't believe that I am on this one. I believe that The Undertaker is done. So, overall rating for um, WWE 25th anniversary, to me, what was shown and what was presented to us as viewers and not live, uh, not live in person off camera I give it a solid gold because there you know you couldn't ask for a better send off for and a better recognition so I'm I've rambled for about a minute giving or an hour actually giving you this review so this is K-Pock signing off and I hope you guys enjoy K-Pock's raw review there's going to be more of these hopefully it won't be as long and in depth on the next ones but this was such a big one I figured you know, I'm going to make it count, but I think we have seen uh, Undertaker's retirement. And for a dark character, you're not going to hear a dark character in Persona say, I officially announced my retirement. That's just not it. But the way his character is, it's going to be like, you know, hey, it's time to rest in peace. So, to all my WWE fans out there, hope you guys enjoyed this. Got a little insight on what I think was going to happen and stuff and my theories hope you enjoyed it this is k-pop signing off see ya <laughs>